Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Deborah Pinels. I serve as a forensic consultant for SMI Advisor. Additionally, I serve as the director of the program in psychiatry, law, and ethics, and as adjunct clinical professor of psychiatry at the University of Michigan Medical School. I am also senior medical and forensic advisor for the National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors. I have spent my career working at the interface of mental health and criminal legal systems. Today, I will be interviewing Dr. Matthew Edwards and Dr. Elizabeth Ford about their professional experiences in correctional psychiatry, working with people with serious mental illness, or SMI, and how these professionals adapted to the carceral environment. Dr. Matthew Edwards is a general and forensic psychiatrist and an assistant professor of psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine. He has provided care across various systems, including emergency and crisis services, as well as inpatient, outpatient, and correctional psychiatry. Dr. Elizabeth Ford is the Director of Mental Health and Criminal Justice Initiatives at Columbia University. Dr. Ford has been in direct care and leadership positions throughout her almost 20 year career, including at Bellevue Hospital and Rikers Island. Thank you both for joining me today to discuss your experience working with people with SMI in correctional settings. These are important places for care to be delivered. And so we appreciate your taking the time to share strategies on the best ways for psychiatrists to adapt to a carceral environment. Let me start with Dr. Ford. Can you tell me about the first time you saw a patient with SMI in a correctional facility as a treating psychiatrist and describe your impressions? Sure. Thanks, Dr. Pinals. Um, I will start by saying that it's frequently hard to know who actually has serious mental illness and who is just responding to the chaos and risk of correctional environments and behaving in ways that may mimic serious mental illness. Um, there, are two, there are two patients who come to mind who came in on the same night, actually, um, referred into the hospital. I worked on a jail hospital unit um, a public hospital in New York City, both men, both young adults, both Hispanic, both frequently hospitalized. Um, and one was referred for throwing urine and threatening officers and had been labeled as a malingerer, which is not an uncommon um, label for people who are in carceral settings. And when I went to see him in the like intake holding area, um, I, went, I went there to do his H&P and he was huddled in the back of the cell. Um, and my first impression, which I think was your question, was of one of a real, just a scared child. And I had read his history and what I was looking at in front of me and what I had read did not match up. Um, and the more I got to know him over his hospitalizations, the more it was clear that he had just incredibly complex PTSD, which again is back to the definition of serious mental illness. It was just his response to the trauma. And then the second patient same night um, had a had a very clear bipolar diagnosis and came in manic um, because he was writing a book all night long in the jail. The officers wanted to take his writing materials from him and he threatened them when they wanted to take it away. My initial impression of him was that he was brilliant. He gave me his pages to read and then he and then I, I, I think I said something like wow, you know, this, this, is, this is quite brilliant, I might have even said. And he stopped talking and he thanked me for acknowledging him. And we had a pretty logical conversation. And so I, that to me indicated how important it was to be as human and as respectful as possible to the patients. Those are incredibly compelling stories. Dr. Edwards, can you answer the same question? Thank you, Dr. Pinels. Um... And Dr. Ford, um, the first time I saw a patient with serious mental illness in a correctional facility um, was a little over a year ago. Um, prior to that, my only other experience in a correctional facility had been as a forensic evaluator during residency. I remember walking through the jail and the security gates and being processed in that way and finding my way to the mental health unit. And my first thought upon arriving to the unit was that it did not look like the hospital units I was accustomed to. 
the floors were cement, the tables were coal and metal, the walls were brick and fading, and I could hear the loud noise, yelling, and the cell doors closing on the adjacent units. And I remember thinking, how am I supposed to treat a patient in these circumstances? Where is the therapeutic environment in this? Um, but it was all that I had. Um, and I was sort of nudged to, to move the process along, um, given time restraints. Within a few minutes um, after speaking with my patient, um, or before speaking with my patient, the deputy brought the first patient and um, we began to discuss his mental health. And after a few minutes of asking questions, getting to know the patient and trying to come up with a care plan, I found that it felt quite similar to the type of one-on-one -on -one work I do with my other patients in other settings. And as I continued to work um, in the correctional setting that day, more and more of my approach was really trying to look beyond, beneath, behind, or what have you, the jail walls and, and using the tools I developed in my practice. Um, whether that's rapport building, agenda setting, or psychoed, um, really I was just trying to meet the patient um, where he was to sit and bear witness with them and to treat him. Um, and I think that became the way that I tried to relate to all the patients that I saw in the correctional setting. Another great, compelling example. So let me start with you this time, Dr. Edwards. So you talked about some of the ways you adapted to how you uh, treated the patients. Can you say some strategies for others that might be interested in how you adapted yourself to the environment? I think although the correctional environment is in many ways different from the acute inpatient environment or other environments, it, it's similar in some ways. And so I think the strategies I've used to sort of adapt in a general sense are not that different from what I do in other settings. Um, for me, safety came first, and that include, included ensuring my own safety, safety of my colleagues and patients. Um, I tried to be observant. Um, I tried to monitor micro interactions and listen to my patients whenever they spoke about their concerns. I would always introduce myself to the deputy or corrections officer on duty. Uh, I would explain where I plan to sit, who I hope to see and get their feedback. And I would always ask if they had any concerns for the unit. I think the next thing that I did was to try to find a rhythm and a style that made me comfortable and confident in what I was doing. I was careful about self-disclosure, whether that be intended or unintended. And I found a place to conduct my work where I felt safe and a place that allowed me adequate proximity um, to resources should I need them. And I think lastly, um, with many correctional facilities, minimizing the use of phones, computers, electronics, what have you, I found ways to organize my notes, um, review patient charts, keep up with my objects, develop a rhythm, and try to minimize any occurrence of any careless errors or omissions or misplacing my belongings. And I think this allowed me to see my patients safely and efficiently, but also with the confidence that I needed in order to really provide the best care that I could. And I think this was crucial for me um, to function in the correctional setting. Great, really, really helpful. Dr. Ford, you've spent years working in correctional settings. I know you're a strong advocate for best practices, but tell us about your own personal experience adapting to a carceral setting. Sure, and um, just to echo Dr. Edwards' comments. I share all of those, so I'll try not to repeat them. I think that's great advice. I would, um, I'll, I think I'll highlight two, two issues. The first is um, learning frustration tolerance. <laughs> so really, really important it was for me to first recognize how my own frustration was impacting my well-being and the way I was conceptualizing the work um, and I actually was introduced to um, mindfulness in my work in the jail system. And so very concretely, uh, what has been incredibly helpful to me are things like breathing, counting, um, forcing my face to be like calm and not uh, not sort of wrinkle. Like there's very like biofeedback kind of um, practices and mindfulness practices that have been incredibly helpful because a lot of the work involves waiting for people to do things, waiting to get in, going back and forth through metal detectors, watching disrespect 
um, watching things happen that you wish were not happening. So many things that um, you can really affect your emotional health. I, and so I've found that just simple things like breathing three times before I make an intervention when I'm frustrated is helpful. And then the other piece that I wanted to highlight was that was it's really more about, I think, resisting adapting to the environment actually, and trying to highlight humanity wherever it exists. So that includes, and Dr. Edwards mentioned this, talking to patients, calling them by their first name, you know, honorifics and then their last name, shaking hands, making eye contact, talking to them as human beings rather than as numbers or inmates, doing the same with the officer staff, the custody staff. So I tried very hard, was not always successful, but tried very hard to get to know everybody's name, to be respectful of the stars on their um, epaulets, and to be as inclusive as you know, healthcare allows in the work that I'm doing with them so that there's not to sort of minimize the us versus them dynamic that exists throughout the settings. Great, those are great examples. All right, I'm gonna pivot back to you, Dr. Ford, again, um, to ask you what are what's some advice you would give correctional mental health providers who are working with individuals with SMI to make their experience in a carceral setting more meaningful and positive? Yeah. Okay. I got four. It's not, it's not an exhaustive list. Um, first one, and I don't think in any particular order, but is to um, connect or maintain um, an academic affiliation so that it allows you to be involved in teaching or writing or research or some area that um, engages your, your intellectual thinking about the work that you're doing. And that also helps um, when you're teaching something to other people, it helps you really think about what you're doing. Um, I think that can be incredibly helpful um, and positive. Similarly, to get involved as much as you can, and um, doctors are certainly often invited to these, to get involved in policy discussions and quality improvement efforts that happen in these settings. And they do happen. Um, and so that it, it allows you to feel like you have some ability to change a system that can be incredibly frustrating and difficult. Um, I think finding mentors and colleagues who do the same work, incredibly helpful. I'm, I'm, I'm around, I mean, and there are tons of people who are so happy to, to, to talk to anybody or connect people in that regard. And then I think um, perhaps maybe what's been the most important for me is just philosophically recognizing that the population of patients that you care for in carceral settings are um, some of the most vulnerable uh, patients who have been subjected to some of the worst social, racial, and developmental trauma in our country, and also the patients that people don't want to take care of. And so that's a huge responsibility, um, and I also think a huge honor. And that can be, I think, really helpful in terms of um, maintaining passion and commitment to the work. Wonderful, wonderful. Dr. Edwards, what's some advice that you would give others? Thanks, and I'll I'll try not to uh, repeat some of the things that uh, Dr. Ford said, but I echo them them all. Um, some advice I would give uh, correctional mental health clinicians is one: I think get to know your colleagues in the jail setting as you would, or a carceral or a correctional setting as you would in any other setting. Um, you'll you'll encounter staff who are reserved, who might be resistant to 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 being uh, too open, but it's important that you introduce yourself, state your name, as Dr. Ford mentioned, learn their honorifics, address them by their titles, um, learn their names, um, and know when, where, and how to enlist their help or support if you need it, and offer yourself to be available to them as well, um, and recognizing that the care of these pa uh, patients is, a, is a, it's a joint effort, it's a team, team effort. Um, the other advice I would give would be to look beyond the jail walls when you care for patients. Um, these people are likely members of your community um, uh, with extended families that live amongst us that make up the fabric of our society. Um, my experiences in the justice system has been one that I've met so many incredibly intelligent people, some of the most intelligent people I have in my life um, who can teach you a great deal about mental health, um, about the natural history of a disease, um, 
about the mental health system, but also about trauma, um, systems of care, and the ways in which they've had to um, navigate society and these various systems. And these are lessons that you quite simply can't get um, from reading a textbook or even hearing um, someone speak about them um, in a lecture. Um, the last piece of advice I would give, I think, would be to allow yourself some space to process the feelings of discomfort that might inevitably come up in a correctional setting. And whether that's frustration with the overcriminalization of the mentally ill or of racially and ethnically oppressed persons, um, of being processed um, through the jail um, as a number with a credential, um, the lack of comprehensive support for those with serious mental illness who are ensnared in the legal system, um, difficulty making the jail feel like a therapeutic space that you're used to practicing in and training in, um, or even the frustration you might encounter with recidivism and watching the same individuals or the same individual cycle multiple times uh, through the setting or a safety concern um, at its most basic level. It's okay to notice these things. It's okay to react to them and it's okay to consider ways and get involved in ways to mitigate them. Those are great responses. And I'm so inspired by both of you and your eloquence. And I really wanna thank you for sharing these experiences and the unique challenges that you've faced as correctional psychiatrists treating people with SMI. And thank you for that work. And, you know, making these, these uh, vignettes come alive for people who might be interested in this work, which is so important because we have so many people that are spending time in a carceral setting and we need excellent provision of care uh, wherever they are. So the tactics that I heard you share is really, you know, one of the key ones is to not forget humanity and to realize that the people that you're treating, the patients are the fabric of the community and have family members that are the fabric of the community. And but for the walls would be in the community and, and the community is part of, of the work that you're doing. So really not forgetting that piece of humanity, thinking about the trauma that they may have experienced and the trauma that you may experience in these settings and finding intentional ways to deal with it uh, and to really turn it around um, with the strategies that you outlined to make the work of a correctional psychiatrist rewarding and compelling and desirable. And I think those strategies uh, and hearing about the strategies in your experience will benefit practitioners of all levels, not just psychiatrists who are working in these settings. So again, I wanna thank you very much for your time and wish you well in, in continuing this journey of, of work that is so meaningful.